John 19, 26, on your screens right now. It says, when Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple that he loved, he said to her, dear woman, here is your son. This is a moment that takes place on the cross while Jesus is dying on the cross for your sins and for mine. And, and if you've been to Sunday school, you might know that there are several stations, several different things that happened while he was on the cross suffering. And this is one of those moments is that Mary, his mother, is there watching her son suffer and die. And Mary, Jesus sees her and he cares about his mama, amen? He cares about his mama. And so he sees this disciple standing next to Mary and it's John. And he says, you're gonna take care of her after I'm gone. And it's just this beautiful moment. But when John writes about this moment that happened in John 19, 26, he doesn't call himself John there. And Pastor Ricky preached on this last week. He doesn't call himself John. He calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. There's actually five different times in the book of John where he refers to himself that way. John calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. It's an identity statement. It's massive. And like I said, Ricky preached on this last week and helped us get set on our identities. But as I thought about today's message, I knew I had to come back to this idea because it's it's just such a big part of the foundation for the rest of what I want to talk about. So we're going to spend the first section of this message talking about identity again. And then we're going to talk about water baptism and how the two go hand in hand. You ready for this? You're, you're starting to quiet down on me now. Are you ready for this? Let's go. Let's go. I'm pumped. Okay, so next is people have given you different identities in your life, and we're just going to, again, we're just going to play around with these just a little bit. Three dark identities that have been spoken over you. So the very first one is that you are never beautiful, fit, fun, or talented enough. You're just you, and you should have been better. That's been spoken over you. And there are people out there and they're good enough, but not you. You got some things wrong with you. And, and you sit there and you stare at the screen and you scroll and it speaks that message into you all while you're scrolling, doesn't it? And you see their highlight reel and you see their airbrushed pictures and you see what everybody else out there is doing with a whole different life and who knows where they came from or where they're going but you see that and you feel excluded and not accepted by it. Uh, the Wall Street Journal came out with an article. It's making big waves right now. Just five days ago, days ago they published this. And Facebook had done some internal studies and some kind of whistleblower came forward and actually gave some of the internal documents that Facebook had done to the Wall Street Journal and if you know anything about this, Facebook has like actually testified, Mark Zuckerberg testified before Congress that they, he believed Facebook and Instagram uh, were not bad at all for people's mental health and emotional well-being and sense of self-concept. And you're laughing because you're right. You know how hilarious that is. But that's been their position. And Wall Street Journal came up with some internal documents where they had done their own studies and they said, we at Instagram make body image issues worse for one in three teen girls. They are internally admitting it to themselves. And that should shock you. It shocks me. Part of what shocks me there is one in three, that's way too small a number. And we know that. And we know it's not just teen girls. It's all of us even in adults. We can talk about this like it's a teenage problem. We're doing the same thing to each other, are we not? Somebody amen that. Amen. Yeah. Parents, we should think more carefully about what we put in the hands of our kids. We really should. And what accounts we let them create and try to think through what the modern devices are doing to the hearts of our young people, we should think that through better. And we should think through better what it is that we're doing to ourselves. But here's the big deal. You'll never be accepted. You're just not enough. Here's the next identity that I need you to think about. Um, you are supposed to be that impressive thing. So somebody, when you were growing up, they told you that you were supposed to be a thing. Like, you're supposed to be a doctor, mom said. 
or dad said. You're supposed to be a lawyer. You're going to be like, you're going to have, you're going to have the degrees that we never had. You're going to have the money that we never had. And they spoke an identity to you. You're supposed to achieve, right? And that achievement has hung over you. And, and, and you have spent your entire life trying to, trying to hit it. And you were supposed to, by the way, also have a perfect marriage and perfect kids and a perfect dog and a perfect white picket fence. That's what you're supposed to have. And that's stuff that we're supposed to be, that impressive thing. You may even be here today and you got the degree. You may be here today and you did accomplish a lot. But the truth is, if you're honest with yourself, you know that you go to bed at night and you know that you're not done. You know that for every accomplishment, there's something else right after it. And you've got no peace in your heart and you're not settled and you can't stand before God and say, I'm enough. Because you know somebody out there thinks you're not enough yet. And it'll never change. You'll reach forever and you'll never arrive. Let's go after the third identity spoken over us. People spoke words over you that have held you back. People spoke words over you about your sin and your shame and your past. And, and it wasn't just you did this thing. It wasn't just that you had an addiction. It is, it's that you are an addict. You don't have an alcohol problem. You are an alcoholic. And people spoke these words over you. And, and maybe at one point in your life, maybe you deserved a little bit of it. I did. But it's become something bigger. And it's become a label over you. And those labels hold you back. And when, I mean, we're about to go into the holidays, right? Like you're going to go and you're going to be surrounded at the big table with your family. And when you go there, for some of us, you're going to go there and there's going to be this invisible label that hangs over your head. And you know that I am known in this crowd as that person. Yeah, and it's, it's the cage that hold, holds us back. You'll always be like your mother you'll end up just like your father. People speak these words, and these words are cages to us. So how's that feel? We're starting kind of dark, right? <laughs> I know. But isn't that real? Isn't this what we're living in? Yeah. And we're swimming in these identities, and they've been spoken over us, and this is our culture, and these are our families. And you got the Apostle John who says, I'm the disciple Jesus loved. Ooh. So when you were a little kid, what did you dream of? I'll tell you what you dreamed of. You dreamed of a friend, that you would have a friend, and you would have a friend that accepted you on day one no matter what. You dreamed of that. It's like, you know, the, the Hollywood movies, they tell us like we all, all want to be part of a crowd and part of the, the popular crowd and stuff like that. That's not what you dreamed of as a kid. You dreamed of like, someday I'm going to walk down the hall and I'm going to meet that person who looks me up and down and says, I'll be your friend. And I'm going to accept you and I'm going to like you even for the rest of your life. Because there's nothing wrong with you and we'll be buddies. And you knew when you were a little person, if I could just find that, it's like I've won the lottery. Like that's all I want. I'll be done. I'll be good. Didn't you feel that? We all did. It's what, it's what we want down deep, and this world will not give to us. I was at a wedding yesterday, officiating a wedding, and these two beautiful kids come up, and they're in love, and they can get married, and I'm a, you know, and everything, the, the, the music and the flowers and everything's beautiful and everything's wonderful, you know, and they're going to say these vows, and they have no idea what they're saying, not really. <laughs> they're great people, but... 25 years of marriage, it's like just, you know, anyway. <laughs> I know. I. <laughs> but here's the thing. Again, great folks. But it's like, if they were there saying their vows, and if, they, if one of them said in the ceremony, I know this is silly, but if they said in the ceremony, you know what, I can't wait till this wedding is done so that I can make this person change so that they'll change. 
if they would have said something like that, I would have said, stop the wedding. Because this is not a marriage. A marriage is two people come together and they look each other up and down and they say, I've decided to love you from day one. No matter what. And it's like, wouldn't it be good if they changed and improved? Of course it would. And that's great. And that is, yeah, you, you want that. But your love isn't dependent on it. Amen. And if you can't love them from day one, you shouldn't marry them. And I know when I say it, we've got a lot of brokenness in this area, don't we? But that's the way it's supposed to work. Because that's what you've longed for since you were a kid. And so you got the gospel of John comes along. You know about the gospel of John? Do you know this guy, John? He didn't write his gospel right after Jesus died and was risen. John wrote it later. If you were here last week, you heard Pastor Ricky talk about that. John wrote it later. He was an old man when he wrote the gospel of John. He had decades. Now, some of you people have got some age on you, and I'm not going to make eye contact with you right now. I'm just looking at the back. But some of you got some age on you, And you know that when you look back over life with decades in your past, you've got perspective. And John is the guy who writes the gospel of Jesus Christ with perspective. And in the midst of his perspective, he could have just called himself John. He could have said, I'm the guy who did this for Jesus. He could have said a lot of things about himself, but he doesn't. He says, I'm the guy that Jesus loved. Jesus loved me. God. Are we not ambitious, capitalistic Americans? Doesn't that sound passive to us? It does. But John's like, I was loved. If I look back on it after all these years, if you had to define who I was, the best thing that I ever did was let Jesus love me. Whoo! And is it possible that that's the one identity that brings sanity to all the insanity? Yes, Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You got the answer right, sir, right over there. I love that he does that for us. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That right there is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that on day one, you can go to Jesus and not earn anything. The fact that you can go to Jesus and say, I'm one of the ones that's never pretty enough, Jesus. Will you take me? I'm one of the ones, I haven't done the impressive thing yet. I'm one of the ones, I'm still pretty screwed up. Will you just love me? And on day one, he will. How would you like that? How would you like that incredible gift from God today where he forgives your sins day one done? You could say amen right there. How would you like it to come to God and be accepted regardless of what your past is, day one, not having to earn it. You can say amen right there. Amen. How would you like to come to God and be loved and never have to fear that he'll take his love away? Day one. Amen. amen. Now you're getting it. You see what Jesus brings to the table. Do you start to get just a touch, just a hint of the fact that this thing created a grassroots movement when it came out that turned the ancient world upside down. And we go to our, like, you know, churches, and we attend our services. Why why is Christianity such a big thing? Because of this. And, And you weren't taught this. You weren't taught this. Even in the church, you weren't taught this. You were taught that you had to get yourself cleaned up before you came to Jesus. You were taught that if you came to Jesus, you better get busy and you better give a lot and you better serve a lot and you better do all of these things. And you were taught that kind of performance mentality even in the church. And that is not the gospel. We're going to go to Ephesians 2 because I got to prove it to you. Ephesians 2 verse 8, God saved you by his grace when you believed And you can't take credit for this. It is the gift from God. God saved you. You didn't save you. That's what that says. You weren't one of those special ones that listened extra hard at the Bible study, and therefore you got saved. That's just not it. God reached into reality, pulled back the fabric, and grabbed your soul. Right? I'm the disciple Jesus loved. 
That, I mean, that's where you should land. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. If you don't know that verse, you need to memorize it. You need to highlight it. You need that verse in your life. Amen. Because this is it. God by his grace. And we struggle with that, don't we? We struggle that we bring nothing to the table for Jesus. We kind of want to. Kind of want to bring something to him, right? Like, I want Jesus to wake up and be like, man, I'm so glad Josh Trubla joined the team. Man, that's a good day. No, nope. you, you didn't bring anything. You didn't. Not that he doesn't value you. He does. But he didn't save you so that. Nope. That's not the way that it worked. And sometimes we struggle with this, don't we? Sometimes we struggle with, with like, wait a second. If I, just, if I just believe that all I am is the person that God loved, how will I get better, though? How will I be motivated to improve? How will I be motivated to accomplish things for the kingdom of God? Won't I become a passive person if I accept amazing grace that looks like that? No. And this is where it's hard to believe the gospel. This is where it's hard to not just believe it on day one, to, but to believe it every day for the rest of your life. Okay, you, if, if you accept the gospel... If you get saved, you will get saved on a day and then you'll spend the rest of your life trying to believe that you just got saved. That's been my life, is trying to, to deepen my belief in the fact that this is actually true because it's like I've been brainwashed by my culture. I've been brainwashed by all of these things that tell me, no, you gotta achieve, dude, you gotta work. No, grace is you don't have to work. The work's been done for you once for all. And if you can actually release yourself to that, you're like, but what's the engine of growth? I got no, I got no bull whip behind me. Like, the engine of growth changes. It is no longer my fear that God will leave me. It is no longer any of that stuff. It is the fact that the engine of growth is grace. Amen. Grace comes in. And says, you're so crazy, deeply loved, you won the lottery. Now live the rest of your life thankful, in love, worshiping him, helping other people find him. Why? Because it, it naturally comes out of you. And some of you guys are like, you're not getting to that place where grace actually does that for you. And the reason is because you're dragging those other identities along with you. And you're like, Jesus, it's cool that you died for me on the cross, but I've also got my accomplishments. Did you see? And all that does is it stops the power of grace in your life. Let it go, Elsa, let it go. Verse nine, salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done, so none of us can boast about it. This is why there should never, ever be a Pharisee in any Christian church ever. And yet there are so many. So no one can boast. No one can ever boast about what God has done for them. We should all just be speechless. Except when I tell you to say amen, then don't be speechless. Amen. Amen. So you go back, right, to when this was a grassroots movement and they turned the ancient world upside down and people got saved individually, right? It was this massive thing because it changed everything about them because their culture wasn't actually all that different from our culture, fundamentally. So it was huge. And when they would get saved, right? Like they would reach out to Jesus like, save me, and they would feel it. And oh my gosh, it's a whole new life. And when they did, they would get baptized in water. You ever see people get baptized in water? It was like this one-two punch kind of thing, right? Like they would, they would get Jesus and then they would go and get dunked in water. And it feels like the most random thing in the world. But they would do that. You see people get uh, baptized in church. They get baptized in rivers. I baptized somebody once in the Amazon River and there were, there were uh, piranhas swimming all around us. And thank God I didn't know it until it was over and I was back in the boat. And they're like, you know you're surrounded by piranha but they weren't hungry that day, I guess. <laughs> but it's this amazing thing, and it's this beautiful thing that we're supposed to take part in, this baptism. Now, why do we get baptized? Let's look at Colossians 2, verse 12. 
It says, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. See, it ties the two things together. It says, when you get baptized, it's like you die. It's like you got buried. And and, and here's the idea, is I bring all my old life to God and all my old identities, right? And he says, they've all got to die for you to go forward. And when you let them die and say, Jesus, I'm not going to touch him ever again. Like my old life, my old life is done. You go down under the water, like see that person going down under the water, that's them being buried. And then when they come back up, It is like a picture of them being resurrected just like Jesus was to a new life. So what he's telling us here in Colossians is that the reason Christians get baptized is it's because it's a visual parable. Every single time a Christian gets baptized, we see a parable. Super simple, right? It's like kindergarten level. It's like, and this is what we're supposed to do. And God gave us this thing to do. So let's keep reading. This is uh, verse 13. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature, and it was not yet cut away. And then God made you alive in Christ, for he forgave all your sins, and he canceled the record of the charges against us, and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. Some of us feel like, even when we come to Jesus, that we've still got our whole past like like a bad resume trailing behind us. This says God canceled it. Amen. It's gone. I, just, I needed you to see that today. That's part of that death and resurrection process that's supposed to happen. See, a Christian is supposed to go into the water, and they're supposed to be cleansed, and all the dirt stays behind in that dirty water as they walk out brand new. And I'm not saying spiritually baptism saves you. It doesn't. I could give you a whole host of verses on on people who were saved even though they were not yet water baptized. So don't get confused about that. But it's a huge part of this one-two punch process that God has for us. And baptisms are awesome, especially the way we do it here at Grace. We do some great baptisms. We're doing baptisms in two weeks, Sunday, two Sundays from now, and we're doing it right in there in the baptismal that we have. It's right behind that screen. I baptized a lot of people in my life, but man, when I came to Fort Sill as a pastor, I got to tell you, things got much more interesting for me as a pastor who baptizes people because some of these soldiers are big. (laughs) And I'm not. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) It's like, (laughs) and there's times that I'm in that baptismal, you know, there's a line out there, people getting baptized. I see some of these guys coming and I'm praying the whole time, like, oh God, help us both survive this thing. And, uh, and God has been faithful thus far, but there was one, let me talk to you about technique here for a second. Okay. Cause this is important. Like when you get baptized, you got to keep your feet planted. Okay. You got to keep your feet planted because I'm not actually lifting you as a whole person here in the water. Okay. So you're got to keep your feet planted and then you're just basically leaning back and I'm putting you down underneath the water and you're bringing me, bringing you back, but you got to keep your feet planted. And that's not a very big baptismal. And there was this one soldier here, huge guy. And it's happened to me a few times. But he got so excited, he throws his feet up. And I mean, his head was going right for the stairs. It was going to be bloody and awful. And I've got, you know, it's like on his nose and behind his head. I'm just wrenching him back. There was a staff member who was taking video, and they actually got the frames of the look on this guy's face and my face. One of these days, I'll show that to you. (laughs) Oh, it's a good day. Keep your feet planted. That's all I'm saying. In Matthew 28, after Jesus died and was, was raised again, he meets with his disciples right before they start the whole movement and plant churches. And Jesus gives them what's called the Great Commission. And when he does, he tells them, he says, go into all the world and he says, preach the gospel. Tell people what the good news is. And he's like, and make disciples. And that's like, get people saved. 
And then he says, and then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, and then teach them to obey everything so that they can follow the path because people don't know what the path is. So you got to read their Bible and learn, learn over their lifetime what the path is. But he says, baptize them. I mean, it was right in the mission statement. Like, you got to help people get saved and then get them water baptized. It's not this optional thing. And sometimes we treat it like this optional thing. Get water baptized. It's this beautiful picture, and it's a picture that matters in your life. Why? Because walking the path of Jesus is about taking steps. It's not that you have to take those steps in order to be loved. Are we clear? But he's got steps for you to take, and each step's got a blessing for you. And each step sets you free. And it's like, and those steps matter. And he gives you this, this beautiful, incredible step. Do you ever get teary-eyed when people are getting baptized? Isn't it an amazing thing? I mean, there's so many things that it reaches down right into our soul about because it's like when people get baptized, they're doing the thing that they did in ancient days. Those people, all they did was get baptized, just like we're getting baptized. And I love God. I love, I love how he gives us such a simple thing to do, isn't it? He's not like, go take a class and take a test and like, we'll give you a diploma or something. I mean, he doesn't do any of that. He's like, let somebody dunk you in water. Like, that's your first step. It's like, anybody can do that, right? Like, you can be educated or not educated. You can have money or not have money. You can be smart or not be smart. You can have power or not have power. You could know nothing about the Bible and say, dunk me. And that's just the way God is. Even when it comes to communion, isn't he that way? Like he comes in and he's like, hey, here, have a cracker and have a little bit of juice. Like two of the most easy things to find in any grocery store ever. Here's a cracker, here's some juice. Go and get that. And if, if you just get that, you can have a moment with God called communion. And you can remember what Jesus did for you. And you're like, what is it about that, right? It's like there's nothing deeply spiritual about just taking that stuff and eating it and drinking it. There's something deeply spiritual, but God has a way. He starts us in the physical realm, and then wonderful spiritual things happen. And he just knows us. He gets us. So it's like we go and we like, we like see that cracker and we see that communion juice, and there's just something about the taste of it, and it takes us back to every other time we've done communion because we're humans and we connect all these dots together, and it helps us more quickly enter in and remember what Jesus did for us. And so God knows that about us. And it's the same thing with baptism. It's this parable. It's this thing that you need. And it's a big deal. I told you about this wedding I was at yesterday. And again, there's love, right? You got the, got the, 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 the man and the wife. And it's like, and they've got, they've got deep things between each other. And they've got commitment between each other. And it's not the vows that will make them married legally maybe, but it's not the certificate that will make them married. It's the love that they have and the sense of commitment that they have. But here's the thing, that stuff is invisible, is it not? For the most part. It's between them. They know what really keeps them connected between each other. And so there's so much about a marriage that actually, if you think it through, it's very, very invisible to the naked eye. And yet, what do we do in a wedding? We put rings on their fingers, do we not? We put rings on their fingers. Why? Because that makes what was invisible visible to us. And I can see it now. And the fact that they, they, they make that choice and they say, I'm going to wear this ring for the rest of my life. I'm going to identify with this person. So like if you're a natural born flirt and you've been married and you're walking around with one of these on your finger and somebody else walks up to you, that's going to change the conversation, is it not? It should. Or things just got creepy, right? You ever see the movie Unbreakable? Bruce Willis? It's always the superhero shows. I know. I'm sorry. I'm just consistent about it. But Bruce Willis, and he's, he's super strong in this movie. And he's unbreakable. Like, nobody can hurt him. Nobody can touch him. And, and then superhero stuff ensues the rest of the movie. It's awesome. But at the very, very beginning, what you learn is even though he's physically unbreakable, his marriage is very broken. And things are bad between him and his wife. And so you start with this scene, and it's Bruce Willis, and he's on a train, and this girl comes up and starts to flirt with Bruce Willis. And the camera pans down to his hand, and he slips his ring off his finger and puts it in his pocket. And you know, right? 
Like you just see that little action and you just know what that means. He's choosing to not identify with his wife and he's choosing to keep his options open. When you put the ring on your finger, you're not keeping your options open. And there's something powerful about that. You need to get baptized. Because there's something about going public with your faith and saying, I'll make what's invisible, visible. And when I do, there may be some people that ask me some questions because maybe they see it online or maybe they're in the room. Maybe they hear about it. And the truth is, I'm not going to be able to keep my options open anymore in my conversations with people. And when folks come to me and they're like, Pastor, I, I just I struggle to get baptized. Sometimes, I mean, very uniquely, sometimes it's like they just can't do crowds. And we got special ways that we do, do baptism so it doesn't have to be this massive crowd. So if you need that, let us know that. But a lot of times it's not about a crowd. It's about the fact that there's going to be two or three people that might find out and that's going to be difficult. And if I could just be honest with you, it may be that you need to walk through that difficulty and that God might actually break some bonds in your life and set some really good things free for you. But I think you need that. The beauty of baptism. I'm going to finish you up with a little story. Um, And it's in Acts chapter 8. And I just love this one. I just think it shows us all kinds of things. Um, And I'm just going to run through it, and it's going to be relatively quick. But it's the story in the book of Acts, and it's a guy that gets baptized. And I just want you to see how this happens because it's kind of funny. And it just, again, it gives us a sense of how this happened in the New Testament, right when the church was being planted. So just imagine, if you will, book of Acts, and, and, and they are turning the world upside down with the gospel of Jesus, okay? And people are getting saved. And there's, there's two characters in this story. One's Philip and one's an Ethiopian official. And Philip is a leader in the church and he's out there evangelizing people and, 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 and he's crazy, he's doing miracles and the Holy Spirit's using him. And just read Philip. I mean, it's a fun story to just read about Philip. So Philip comes upon this guy and he's an Ethiopian official. And so he's this official government kind of ambassador if you want to think about him that way. And the Ethiopian official, he's called a eunuch. Don't ask me why. I could explain, but let's just put it under this umbrella of ancient weird stuff that happens sometimes. Um, he's, a, he's a eunuch. But anyway, um, this guy had come up to represent Ethiopia to Israel. So he's there on official business. But while he's there, he also worships the one true God in the temple because he's secretly a believer in the one true God. And so the Ethiopian official is traveling back to Ethiopia and he's in a carriage and imagine the train and all his servants around him. And while he's going back, the guy's reading his Bible out loud from his carriage and he's reading the book of Isaiah and Philip overhears him. So here's the actual text, Acts 8, 29. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside that little carriage there. And Philip ran over, heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah and Philip just asked, hey, do you understand what you're reading? Just, you know, casual, making small talk, right? The man replied, how can I unless someone instructs me? And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and to sit with him. So now you got these two guys having a Bible study together. And the passage of scripture that he had been reading was this. Now, before I read it, I want to tell you, this comes out of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was written 800 years before Jesus. And it's a prophecy of how Jesus came to die for our sins just like a sacrificial lamb would die to cover the sins of people in the Old Testament. And it calls Jesus that lamb. So look at this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and he received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from this earth. And then in verse 34, the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else here? And so beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. Now that little phrase right there was probably a multi-hour conversation is how I imagine it. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know exactly how long it was. But Philip used the opportunity and said, you see a little bit of Jesus there? Let me tell you about Jesus. And, and they go full on Bible study now. And he's going to walk him through all of these things and show him exactly who Jesus is and exactly why he died and all of it. He shares the gospel with this foreign guy. 
And look what else happens. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, gosh, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. You know, look, there's some water. Do you love this guy's heart? This guy is pumped. This guy's absolutely getting saved radically right in this moment. He was just in his carriage, minding his own business. The Holy Spirit grabs Philip and says, tell him the truth. And it unwinds all the knots in his entire soul. And when he experiences that and knows exactly what's going on, I don't know what was in his mind. Maybe he thought, Philip, do I need to take a class now? Yeah, do I need to take growth track? Do I, are, there other thing, are there other things that I got to do first? Like, do we have to make a plan? Do we have to wait six months so that all the family can get their schedules synced up? Do I have to work harder and make all these other things right before I come to Jesus? There's all this stuff that's in his question. You got to hear that. And it's like, there's water. Can I just jump in that? Can we just do this thing right now, right this second? And Philip says, yes. And it absolutely, so he ordered the carriage to stop. They went down into the water and Philip baptized him right then and there. And that matters, guys, because it says so much about what salvation is and it says so much about what baptism is and what Jesus actually had in mind. And we, we complicate it, do we not? We slow it all down, we worry, there's water. Let's go. <laughs> that exuberance and joy. <laughs> like that's the New Testament. You wonder like what, what was their attitude like? What was it actually to go into a first century Christian church and experience life and faith like they experienced it? Here's a taster. There's water. Let's go. Man. Maybe you ought to get baptized if you haven't yet. Maybe you ought to not keep your options open. Maybe you ought to make your faith into a living parable that other people can see, right? Maybe you ought to just say, if I'm really going to follow the, the path of Jesus Christ, maybe I should obey the very first thing that he told me to do. Like Maybe all of that is true, and I should just maybe stop thinking about it so much. So we're going to have a service in two weeks, and we want you to be able to do that. I've actually got an elder who's going to be out in the lobby afterward, and he is specifically out there to answer your questions if you've got any questions at all about baptism. Like, what if I was baptized as a kid? What if I was baptized as an infant? What kind of clothes do I have to wear? Dark clothes. You know, plant your feet. You know what I mean? He's going to answer all your questions for you. Does it save me? No, it doesn't save you. Because I haven't done this yet, does that mean I'm not saved? That's not what that means. I can show you verse after verse. They've even got a Bible study out there. It's like a five-page Bible study booklet. I took all my kids through that before we baptized them. Just like read the scriptures for yourself. Engage with it yourself. Make sure that you know what it is that you're about. Sure. Have your Bible study. And they, they'll, they'll give you copies of that when you go out there. But talk to, talk to Dan, get that study, and sign up to be baptized. Amen. Come on, that's way too quiet. Amen. 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 Would you guys stand? I'm going to take you back to one thing just to remind you. And Taylor Streeby is going to come up on the stage as well, and she's going to start playing for us. But I want to walk you through a prayer. We're going to pray right now. We're going to pray for real. Because I think this right here is massive for us. So I want to take you back there. Because that, that's the gospel. And that's salvation. And I said it before and I'll say it again. Some of you guys are Christians today. And you've been in church a long time. And you heard 80% of this stuff. And you said to yourself, I've heard all this before. This is just review. I'm fine. This doesn't touch me. I wish the pastor was talking about something deep today. Let me just tell you, 
That's as deep as it gets. And if you're in a space today, and I don't care how long you've been a Christian, but if you're in a space today where you've taken the gospel that once saved you on day one, and you have slowly but surely over the years begun to bring your other stuff to Jesus, hoping that it would impress him, you need to be purified of that today. You need to make a choice to let go of that stuff. Let grace be grace. That's the deep truth for you. If you've never been saved, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. So we're going to pray right now. Uh, Would you bow your heads, close your eyes, and then we'll sing after this. God, I thank you so much for this time, God, and I pray that you would guide us, Lord, and that you would speak, God, just like you've been speaking this whole time to us as individuals, Lord, that you would just come and, and deal with us, Lord, right now. And I just call out, like some of you, and this is, this is in this room, and this is online too, you're feeling pressure right now. You're feeling God speak to you and convict you. And that's all his love. And he's showing you that he is present in your life, sees right where you are. So I would ask, if you're a person today, you're like, I've heard that gospel, I'd never heard it like that before. This makes sense to me. I want to reach out to, to Christ. I want to give him my whole life. If you're in that space, and this is, this is your first time to give Jesus your life and get saved, would you raise a hand right now? Nobody's looking at you except me, but I want to know who I'm praying for right now. Yep. Thank you for those hands. Praise God. So here's how we do this here at Grace. Is we're going to keep our heads bowed, eyes closed, and we're going to pray a prayer of salvation together. And we're going to take this phrase by phrase, and this is just meant to be an easy, open door if you've never prayed before, or at least never prayed this before. Dear Lord Jesus, I bring my life to you. Forgive my sins. Wipe away my past. Destroy the shame. I love you, Lord. You have a better identity for me. Would you come and set me free? So many of these things, they've had power over me. Set me free. Give me a new life. Fill me with your spirit. Give me purpose. Help me to walk by grace. I love you, Lord. Amen. 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 If you're getting saved today, okay, I mean this for real. If you're getting saved today, you need to get baptized. Sign up. Let's go. We'll do it in two weeks, and we'll get you in. Easy. It's going to be great. Keep your feet planted, though. Yeah. If you haven't been baptized or you got questions, please deal with that today. I want to pray for you in a second. Also, if God is coming, he's speaking right to you about that identity stuff. I want you to deal with that as well. So heads bowed, eyes closed, let's pray. God, I pray for those, Lord, that need to be baptized, God, that you would bless them right now, God, with a a miracle of courage. And I pray, Lord, that everything that has been talk, maybe, maybe even for a long time in their lives, God, maybe faith has just been about talk. I pray, Lord, it would become action. And whatever has held them back, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would, you would destroy those walls, Lord. Help them to take action today. Get their questions answered today. Get them in your word today, Lord Jesus. And God, for those of us, God, and I think this is a lot of us, where that identity stuff, it really touches us and we can see ourselves in all of that mix. God, would you set us free today, Lord? Please set us free. God, I pray that there would be clarity in our minds, God, of how those things, they hold us back and they bind us up and they do not help us actually to go forward in this life. Help us to trust your gospel, that we can actually just be a people that are loved by you. And that's it, done, day one. 
give us that spirit of revelation. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.